Uh, welcome everyone to what's now, I guess we're approaching uh, day three of our course, uh, or at least week zero of our course on pivoting to teach online. One of the aspects that's most critical is the people that are actually impacted by decisions that faculty and designers make. And that's not surprisingly the students. And that's really the center of what we do and what we want to do. And I think it's critical that we have at least a good experience on uh, and voice on the student experience in this kind of environment, especially balancing multiple priorities, different challenges in life. Many people are adding on new stress. It's not like COVID came along and said, okay, now don't worry about this anymore. Uh, just worry about COVID. It's COVID is additional, meaning it's everything else going on plus now this. And I think that presents a lot of challenges for, for students and obviously faculty as well. And many of the people who are either on this uh, session right now or who will view the recording later on, uh, are acutely aware of the experience of suddenly going online and they're experiencing what many students have experienced, which is rapid interest or rapid focus on uh, becoming comfortable with the online environment. So we're fortunate to have three students join us uh, today. Uh, we have Katie, we have Megan, and we have Anita. And we're going to just spend a little bit of time, for lack of a better word, having a conversation on what the environment is like for them, what their experiences were, what they wish their faculty would have known. And it, by the same account, for others uh, that are involved, I see we, we do have uh, Tanya is with us and we have um, Justin's here as well. Let's see, do we have anybody else from our instructional team? I'm not sure if I see Matt yet. Do I see Matt? Um, anyway, and uh, we, we may have uh, Nagan joining us later on. So for now, though, let's get started by uh, just going to a quick, what's your background in this environment? We'll go Katie, Megan, Anita. Um, so just tell us who you are, what you're doing, and what your, your current program is, and, and then we'll start looking at exactly what your experience has been. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, my name is Katherine Craig, or Katie's fine as well. I am a current graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where I'm finishing my master's degree, and I'll be starting my PhD this coming fall at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, my undergrad was from UWL, or University of Wisconsin-La Crosse, where I took nine online courses in my time there. Um, and I had different experiences per different instructor and per different setup because it was all different. And then currently I am a instructor for a graduate statistics course at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So I'm kind of being thrust into having to teach online now. Um, so I'm on both ends of the spectrum here because I am now teaching online as well as taking courses online and having taken them previously in my undergrad. So that's kind of my background scenario right now. Great, thanks. Uh, Megan, what's your life like? Oh gosh. Um, so I am a fully online student at Arizona State doing interdisciplinary studies with concentrations in business and data analytics. Um, I work full time as a data analyst at Adidas. Um, I have three children who are now, um, I'm now homeschooling. Um, so moving into that online space and what that looks like for elementary school students in an online space. Um, and that's something that is really being navigated um, as an equity issue. Um, we don't have a, mm, we're not a rich district. <laughs> um, and a lot, a lot of kids don't have access to um, the technology necessary to go online. So we're looking as a district as to what that looks like. Um, I have a lot of other, other things um, that I do, um, pursuing an athletic career and um, just living life. And so um, I am so glad to be online. Um, will graduate at the end of August. Um, and I was looking to um, move right into a graduate program, um, an MBA program with a kind of subset of data analytics, um, but they've canceled all the GMATs. So we'll see, uh, but that's what we're doing. Very right, well, uh, thanks for that update. And, and there's a lot of dynamics, I guess, that we often don't think about. Uh, there's a whole pipeline of student identification, bringing students into the university process that we're 
we don't really have a comment on. Meaning, you know, we're, we're paying attention to how do you teach online, but there's the how do you select students for programs and how do you enroll students for programs and what's that going to look like over the next six months. And many of the changes we're seeing now are not going to impact us until six to 12 months down the road. So basically we've put, for lack of a better word, a stop on so many parts of the university sector. And we're not even fully aware other you know, students in your case, who might suddenly be saying, well, I've, I've got this to do and I can't get in. And that's clearly an issue. Uh, Anita, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, I'm also an Arizona State online student and this is my final semester. I should be graduating in May. Um, probably won't go to graduation anymore, but will still be something to look forward to. Um, I have a six-year-old at home and he's with my parents right now since you know, I'm occupied other places. I'm, my job's still open, so I'm still going to work. And yeah, I don't know. I've been online, completely online for five years. I started in May of 2015 and just been doing it slowly in between work and everything else. So um, this has been a long time coming. Uh, yeah, I mean, timing could be a little better, I suppose, but I'm glad that I do have a lot of online, I guess, experience because I have a lot of friends and coworkers that go to school um, at, on campus and are texting, emailing, and asking how to find their books and how to you know, find software. So I'm glad I have can be a resource at least in this time. Uh, thanks, Anita. You know, one of the, the things is sort of a thread that all of you have shared uh, that's interesting because it's, you know, right now a lot of teachers are in pure panic mode. Faculty are like, how do we get this done? And uh, all of you had a tone of positivity uh, to your reflections. And that's not necessarily the tone that you see a lot on campus there, there, or online version of campus these days. There's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety on the part of faculty in making this transition. So I think it's encouraging to hear, to hear uh, you sort of articulate that, hey, this is a discrete set of skills that you have developed and that allows you to be successful. And I would assume even once you're done with this online experience that the skills you've acquired as being students are going to have a direct impact as you move into uh, the type of work or even the type of uh, postgraduate or ongoing studies that you're doing. If you could then just pause uh, right now and reflect a little bit because many people are going through a power learning experience as a faculty level, trying to figure stuff out really quickly. But if you were to say new faculty members just getting started, what would you like them to be aware of, reflective of your experience that would help them better address the needs of their own students? Uh, Megan, why don't we start with you and we'll go Megan um, and then uh, Katie and then Anita. I think something really important to keep in mind is the need for differentiation. Um, just as an in-person classroom requires differentiation, so does online. Um, you know, you're going to have people who are super tech, you know, technology-based and who um, are super familiar with the Canvas, for example, that is something that we use, um, who are able to use Zoom and who are um, able to do these things. And you're going to have people who aren't and who are learning those systems brand new themselves. Um, and I think that that's something that needs to be understood for people who are having to jump into this really quickly, is you're going to have people who, who aren't sure. And something that we've been seeing a lot of um, on kind of social networks uh, with students who are having to transition to online, you're having tons of people drop classes because they don't know what to do. Um, and I think that however supports can be offered of like tutorials and maybe, you know, taking that first week to say like, hey, let's walk through how to use Canvas. Let's walk through how to use Zoom. Let's walk through how to submit things online, what proctoring software looks like. Um, I think that that could be really impactful in this time. Um, and at least for now, I think it would be really impactful to soften due dates. Um, you've got this like really hard, like this is due this time. And for us who have been online really consistently, it's not as impactful in that way. Like, but having my children home 24 seven isn't super impactful and makes it so those hard due dates are a little, a little tough. Um, 
So I think that softening those due dates, understanding that we're all doing what we can um, and creating that scaffold of here's how you use the systems. I definitely agree with everything that Megan just said. It's the software that goes into the online courses is so different than anything most students have ever used before. If you've been online before, you get used to it course after course after course and become an expert in it. But with all these new students being thrust into it, unaware of everything that goes into it, it's going to be extremely challenging and daunting for them. Um, I remember when I took my first online course, I had no idea what Canvas was. And it was assumed that I had already knew what Canvas was. And I didn't. And because I had always used D2L. So it was kind of like this transition period where there was an underlying assumption that I knew what I was doing when I did it. So I had to take a step back and basically like do this all myself and learn and catch up to what the first week was, even though I'm like trying to pre prep myself to get there. I wasn't aware that you had to do all this prep period to do almost like an online course. And then up upon that, all the other software that goes into online courses, if you're doing like a statistics class or all these other things that you need to use all these resources, it's like, how do you provide these resource, resources virtually? And sometimes it's through a virtual desktop, but that doesn't always work for certain computers and all these things. So each student's different environment is different for the resources they can acquire. Like online trials for certain software doesn't always work for certain people because they've used it in other online courses. And so it's, it's hard because you never know what a student's coming in with. And that has definitely happened to me a few times where I was like, I have no idea what's going on. And using like the discussion board to talk to people, it's, it works sometimes, but other times it doesn't. So there, it's hard to communicate what you do need and what you don't need, I think, in online courses at some points. I think you're, you're raising uh, terrific points. Both of you obviously are, uh, you know, in terms of that experience and the developmental nature. If you've even had one semester online as, as a student, you're well ahead of the experience of many students uh, right now and, and certainly many teachers. Uh, if you haven't used Canvas before, uh, or you, let's say you, you've used, you've tried experimented online in the past, or you've taught uh, exclusively online courses during certain semesters, or even in blended environments, you're often not aware of how incrementally you've built the skills to succeed, how to download files that and, and uh, work with them in, in the Canvas or D2L file system, uh, how to uh, upload a video on YouTube. I mean, you might think these are rudimentary skills, and they are in many ways. But if you're having to learn those with a range of 20, 30 other small skills on a daily basis, it doesn't take long and it's an absolutely insurmountable experience. Anita, what's your, what would you like teachers to be aware of as they begin this transition? Um, <laughs> definitely that, that people are dealing right now with so much more than just their assignments and their deadlines and even just work or even just family stuff. Like now it's so much more. You might spend twice as long in the gro at the grocery stores, which is what's happening maybe even longer and not finally you need to have to drive more than one place. Um, like all of that has been amplified. So I haven't, this is only my first week doing online school with that, but just going from my past, like, I don't think I could most, like most people like handle all of that um, without some understanding from professors, some flexibility, like, like Megan said, um, like on due dates, for sure. Um, I'm taking an extremely hard class right now. It's a bio class and I have a lot of assignments and I can't push it till summer because it doesn't even happen in a summer class because it's can't be six weeks. So I don't have any other choice. Um, and I'm sure a lot of other people are in similar situations with it, this, they, there's no chance to push it um, or, you know, not do their best on it. So yeah, just understanding um, and knowing there's people they can reach out to. So that's something that I'm pretty big on like helping with as, as I get towards the end of my uh, online um, education and moving into a career, I want to help um, kind of facilitate that understanding between new online students because there's a lot of questions early on and like Canvas is what we have now, but we used to have Blackboard. And when there was that transition, like it was like starting all over for me because just the way everything was organized online. Um, so I imagine for any new student, it's going to be a similar transition and um, questions, lots of questions and knowing where to ask and they don't have time to wait on the phone 
for somebody to answer for it could be hours i'm reading uh like texts from my classes classmates saying they've been waiting on the phone for two hours for help or advice and no we don't really have that kind of time right now so anyway well you raise a good a good point regarding the technologies as well i'd like to hear what you've been using in your different classes what are the tool sets you're using and even if you could comment a little bit on which ones have you found most effective sorry was that for me or are we oh that was an open question but any question. Of you mike why don't okay. you take a run at it and we'll filter through okay um there's a few, you, know, you talk about like software that we were like, that we would recommend to online students. Yeah, or just what if you had experience in and yeah. uh, it could be something particular if you're like, oh, I don't ever use this, burn it. If you find <laughs> it walking down the street, set it aflame. Uh, oh, but could be things that you really- I got you. Um, I definitely recommend um, online, like eBooks for anybody that um, has trouble concentrating on textbooks. I try to get my hands on eBooks for my classes and then share them with my classmates. Um, that's because you can search directly to get to a certain chapter or a phrase. If you're doing a study guide, you can go right to a certain place in it. So, um, I know some people have trouble with like reading on the computer, but, um, for me, I found that to be really helpful. Um, and also a lot cheaper <laughs> than textbooks. So that's something that's helped me a lot. Um, and just knowing that a lot of online classes don't let you have Chromebooks, um, or certain kinds of tablets is important because the first computer I bought for school was a Chromebook because I had no idea and it was the cheapest and it was what I could afford. And then I quickly found out I couldn't download any software and that was required for a lot of classes. Um, also have a good webcam because there's probably going to be proctored exams and I've kind of gone through the gamut with those. Obviously, I don't have a good one right now. Um, so that's important because there's a lot of proctored classes where you ha it has to be very clear and you have to show an ID and if they can't read it, it's not legible, then you can get a a zero on it. Um, so just those kind of things that I wish I'd known and I try to tell like every new student those little things that have helped me. I'm gonna mute now so you guys can take over. All right, great. Megan, how about you? What, what kind of technologies have you used and what would you hope other uh, teachers would be aware of or not use for that matter? Yeah, um, I think that the things that we've mostly used is Canvas. Um, we've used some um, other things like Math Lab and stuff like that, that um, people who are specifically designing for online situations are designing and they're well designed. Um, I think that I have a different opinion on ebooks. Um, I am a hard copy book person, and I think that part of that is um, proctored exams because you get um, a lot of instructors who hold a proctored exam and will not, it's open book, but you can't use another piece of technology and you can't use a browser. Um, so your, your browser's locked down and they won't let you use like a tablet or a phone to access the. Um, access the book. So um, in those situations, I think that there needs to be an understanding that if you're going to have an open book exam, you need to allow people to access ebooks. Um, but there, there have definitely been situations where even it's been two weeks into the term and, and instructors like, okay, so you've got your first exam coming up in a couple of weeks. Like, just so you know, you can't use um, an ebook. And it's like, oh, now all these students have to scramble to try and get a hard copy or print out pages or whatever it is. And I think that um, setting the expectations of what is going to be available um, is, is important. And I see this question popping up. Do you feel that proctored exams feel like an invasion of privacy? I don't love proctored exams. I understand the point of them um, for academic integrity. Um, but I live in a house full of people and it is sometimes I took, I got dinged on an exam one time because I took it sitting on my bed um, because I didn't have a space to take it anywhere else. I don't have a ton of space. I don't own a desk. I don't have an office. Um, and so it was like, that's what I had. And it is, it was really, it can be really difficult to 
create that space. And sometimes I'm doing them right before the due date at 11 o'clock at night, because that's when my house is quiet. So those are the things that I feel. I'm going to pick up the topic of proctored exams in just a minute, because that seems to come up quite a bit. But Katie, let's hear from you first. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, for sure. Um, I've never taken a proct proctored exam online. So I, in all of my courses I've taken, I've never had that experience with my online exams. So um, that's just my input on that. But in general, um, almost all of my online courses up until this point right now have been on D2L. And our university just made the switch as of this semester to Canvas. So I am one, a first time user of Canvas and two, a first time instructor on Canvas. So the switch to a new platform for me is scary, knowing that I have to not only take courses on it now, but also teach on it and not have any idea mostly about this platform. Um, another thing, just to go off the ebook thing is, um, I agree with what they're saying is, I, the ebook situation is a little interesting for multiple reasons. A lot of a lot of times when I took online courses, it's because I couldn't be near the university. And so to get those books, because I was very fortunate to go to a university that gave, that had a bookstore that you didn't have to pay for the books. So you could just pick up your course books. Um, and so I wasn't near that university, so I couldn't get my books. I would have to drive three hours to pick up the book to drive back. And so the ebook was awesome to have online, but then you couldn't use it in certain situations because some of our resources or the exams we took were through the browser where it was like that lockdown browser. If you've ever had an experience with that where it locks down everything on your computer but the exam at a certain period in time, so you couldn't access the ebook. And I am a student that prefers a hard copy book just because that's how I learn better. Um, and knowing that, I designed my course that'll go online now to actually have a hard copy and an e-version for it. So I'm very fortunate to have done that. Um, but that lockdown browser is very hard to use if you need an e-book. Um, and then, again, just really the platforms that we're using is very difficult for some students. And, like, there's some things that... I would actually have to go to the university to use their VPN or to use the university computer to take an online course because I couldn't access certain things through my own uh, laptop unless I used a virtual lab, virtual desktop, which then slowed down the computer rate. So things weren't processing fast enough and it would take your, your computer was on like a 10 second lag because you're actually like, cert, like going into a computer on the university. So it's lagging. Um, and that's like one of the main resources or technology things that I just disliked was that virtual desktop um, for online courses. It just was an awful experience every single time I had to do it, so. So for, for all, any one of you uh, that's just commented on this and has come up around the proctored exam issue because it has, there's some really interesting surveillance issues at play. Clearly it's a, obviously a factor of trust that's at play. Uh, I would find it's a type of diminishment of my personhood if I wanted to start raging. But uh, what do you think universities could do instead of proctored exams? Or is your feeling, look, suck it up. This is the reality. Just deal with this crap and be done with it. It's a brief indignity. I have a lot to say about uh, proctored exams, but I don't know if I'm, it's my turn to talk. But I have one with this class, this Bio 202 with a lab. Um, it's gotten so, so crazy. I mean, you have to show like your arms and like your chair and it's become insane. And I took this, <laughs> I failed this class once. I'm actually retaking it. Um, I won't be too embarrassed to say it's a really hard class. And um, I, it's changed in the two years since I took it last. The, the, just even what they expect. And there is no, nothing around you. And this, this class isn't allowed notes by any means, but like literally nothing. You have to be on a blank desk. I have a workspace, so... That means like clearing everything off and, you know, like completely redoing it just every time there's this exam, this proctored test, and there's a six of them in this class. So it's, I don't know. I, I don't think it's very helpful. I don't think it's gonna help me learn better, but I don't know, maybe for some classes it is necessary. I don't, I don't wanna be the judge on that. I also have a lot of feelings about that. Um, I think that I have never in my professional career had to answer a question off the top of my head without access to resources ever. Um, and that this is m less about proctoring necessarily and more about the way that things are designed. I 
think that when I took calculus, we were not allowed any notes or any resources. And I had to memorize every single formula. And it's just not, it's not the way the world works. And I think that it is a better testament to our education to know that we know how to find the answer rather than we have the ability to memorize the answer. And having a non-proctored exam tells us that we can find the answers. Um, and just like Randy saying, letting students take them multiple times because you, if the purpose of education is to increase the knowledge of the student, then sitting down somebody and saying like, you have to take this test and you have 30 minutes to do it and you have to do it from memory. And like that, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I have had exams where it's like, it's open book, it's open notes. It is a shorter time frame because you, you do have to know where to find it. And you can't just Google everything. You do have to have this basic knowledge. You have to have done the readings. Um, and those are the classes in which I have learned the most. Um, I memorize calculus. I pass calculus. I cannot remember a single thing that I learned. Yeah. And like yep. I said, I've never taken a proctored exam online. All of mine were either through the lockdown browser or just through either um, through D2L where it was time-based. Um, and like Megan was saying, it was, um, we had open notes, had open book because they really can't restrict that because you're not there in person, but you only had so many minutes or seconds to answer a question before it would move on. So like 90 seconds. So you would have had to study prior to know where it was and where to find it. Um, and I felt like, like those exams still were hard for me because they were so in depth, these questions, and you had to know where to find it. Um, and I felt like that was my version, at least with online uh, testing. And I still found it extremely difficult to take. Um, and currently I'm structuring my midterm uh, that I'm gonna be giving in like two weeks to do the same exact format for a statistics course where it's like 90 seconds per question, you need to know where it is, you can have your notes, but you have to be able to find it quickly and know off the bat, so. So there's a few things here that, that I think are obviously problematic and that the teachers uh, who are getting started need to think about, because on the one hand, many universities have a proctoring infrastructure in place already contract with a with a startup or a company that supports it browser lockdowns which have already been mentioned uh, and it makes it difficult for faculty to use sort of non-university approved services and this is me briefly ranting but the people that have driven much of the technology selection on campuses are startups who have a product to sell and each of these discrete services, which can be useful, but they're there to administer the function of the university. And Megan, you touched on this, is if in theory, the role of universities are to learn, then uh, some of these testing approaches may not be the ideal way to go about it. So I'll just quick, quickly return to the question again, just a you know, sentence or two from each of you. What could university teachers do? You've got 130 students in a course, how? should you assess your students from your perspective that doesn't involve large-scale testing or proctoring? I think that depends on the structure of the course. I think that there are courses that lend themselves to that sort of multiple choice ABC um, and I imagine not being an instructor that it is much more difficult to grade and assess um, open-ended answers, but I do believe that having a student write and to even for not hum non-humanities courses to explain how they got to a particular um, conclusion, I think that 
is really impactful. And that kind of stops people from doing what is coming up in the chat of like just resubmitting and resubmitting and resubmitting until they get the right grade or finding, you know, a quiz on, on an online service. Um, I think that it is really impactful and also helps the student learn to go through and say like, this is the answer, but also I got the answer from, this is, this is how I came about it. And this is what I think, you know, whether it's um, different, different kinds of courses. Um, so I, I, yeah, sorry. No, no worries. No need to apologize at all. It's, it's a, it's a tricky situation. And, and I'd love to hear at this point, actually, I'm just going to briefly open the mic up to see if anybody in on the, on the uh, uh, session here has some opinions on how you might deal with this tomorrow during our discussion. Uh, you know, I'll be presenting on some of the concepts of active learning and what's the research angle around engaged active problem based learning. The challenge, though, is assessment and evaluation takes quite a bit longer with that approach. So I'd love to hear from anyone uh, on the call here. How do you think we can reduce the challenges of uh, proctored exams to more authentic assessment in a way that respects both the teacher and the student? George, I know one thing that um, I did um, in some of the courses um, was, um, you know, try to have um, a very uh, common sort of like rubric that I used um, to be able to assess things, but allow the students a lot of flexibility in some of the choices and things they submitted. So let's say I was teaching a U.S. history class and I wanted the learners to be able to uh, know the different plans of the Constitutional Convention, um, you know, key players, things like that. Um, and uh, so I, but I gave them some flexibility to be able to um, choose the kind of uh, work that they wanted to do, depending on their context. So I had people work together and submit group project uh, sort of things like videos. I had people do claymation videos. I had people go and uh, create like graphic novels and newspaper layouts. And um, I got some really, really great engagement from people that were willing to put a little bit more time and energy into it. I really loved it. Um, well, at the same time, I did offer if people just wanted to uh, take a, a more just like a sort of like a, a test as well, um, I gave them that option. Um, so basically, got two different kinds of assignment for the same one. Um, and as I said, the people that, that took advantage of that uh, really they had some pretty robust, you know, awesome work. Um, but, you know, so the people that really just needed to get through it quickly, didn't have a lot of time, and they were able to just take the, the little faster option, you know, within, say, 30 minutes and be done. So that's just something that I've tried in my course, and it, it felt like it's gone pretty well. Samin, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking on this issue of um, proctored exams, and there are some clever strategies that some teachers are using in graduate education, and I just thought if I could share my experiences. Um, a very simple strategy that one of the, I think, uh, firstly, proctored exams may need to be there, but we need to reduce the weightage um, and have just a sort of a subset of the basic content that can be tested in that way. But in order to actually see how much the students have learned, we need to devise some better strategies. And one of these, uh, a very, I thought it was a very clever and a very simple technique that one of our teachers used was that he asked each of us to post a question regarding the content on a simple Google Sheet and that uh, Google Sheet was shared among all students. So every student had a row in that sheet and they were posting questions. So even though we could see each other's questions, obviously we couldn't copy paste another student's question over there. And the second thing was, I think asking a question is a very good way of judging how much the students have really understood from that content. If they can ask an intelligent question, it means they have number one, read the content, and number two, they have understood something about it, which has uh, poised them in a position to ask something. And then counting that was very easy as well as how many students participated. So you can just count that simply. So I think that uh, this can, I mean, strategies like these need to be defined and designed um, rather than having just the 
uh, run of the mill kind of tests that we usually have. Something that I've seen that I really enjoyed from that idea of like posting questions, just like you were saying, is there is a functionality in Canvas where you can lock a discussion board until you make a post. Um, and so I've found it really interesting to be able to, without being influenced by what other people are saying, to say like, okay, you know, based on this module, this is kind of my questions and this is what I'm reading and these are the things that are coming up for me. And then you're able to post it kind of almost in a vacuum that you can then, it unlocks it and you can read uh, what other people are saying. Yeah, I've had that experience, same as Megan, where you couldn't see what everybody else was posting until you posted something. Therefore, you knew you weren't acquiring the content from what other people were posting. And then the way that we were then graded or assessed on this was how in-depth our question was in its relation to the material. Like if it was like one sentence that really wasn't good enough necessarily, it was like you had to give enough detail to show that you did read it and that you did understand and comprehend what was going on. And I found I liked that version of um, being assessed rather than writing a whole comprehensive paper because um, it was briefer. It, I could have continued to like learn and do all these things at once versus spending all this time on one large chunk of paper. I could do all these little tidbits um, to show that I did understand what was going on versus just the exam or the comprehensive paper. And like I said, I like that version in the comments and the locking of each board until you went on. Great, thanks for the reflections uh, on this. And it's, it's not a you know, simple solution. I think one of you mentioned earlier on that the, the dynamics are so different, different laptops, different computers, different technologies, different content. Uh, each, each, each scenario is going to sort of produce a different optimal mix of technologies that are going to work under the constraints that we're facing right now. Tanya mentioned in the discussion for the chat as well that we will be tackling this or more specifically, she and Matt will be tackling this during their discussion on Friday. Let's turn a little bit to, so you've talked about the technologies that you've used. You've talked about some of the experiences you've had. We've br briefly touched on the assessment dynamics that are involved. Could you address the supports that you wish would have been available for you as students when you started online or what kind of experience would have helped you get more comfortable more quickly? Um, I think the one thing um, that would have been more to get me more acclimated to online learning would have then just been kind of what Megan was saying earlier, a brief introduction to the site that you're using or to whatever platform you're using um, and the expectations of how to use that platform because each course focuses on different parts of the platform. So some say use the discussion section of say Canvas or D2L, others will use Zoom to do all these meetings and whatnot. Um, I think just like a basic introduction to all of those would be uh, like really helpful. Another one I think for me would be if your course is going to require some type of group activity that there be some regulations put on that or some type of you understand the uh, the needs or the requirements of the other people you're working in your group because they are online so they're not always going to be online at the same time you are versus in an in-person course you are in the same room at the same time with these people um, that's not how it works online so I think that would be another thing if you are going to require some type of group project that you get to know the people you're working with like what's their work schedule when are their kids out of school what's going on with that um, just so you can know when they will be helping you with the project and whatnot. Yeah, I definitely think it's not a one size fits all for beginning online education. Obviously, people are at different levels um, in their knowledge of like some, I think Megan might have mentioned like technology and even just certain um, writing skills. Um, I don't know. And like I, one of my first classes online was uh, English 102, I think, and it requires an extensive portfolio and hardly any tests or exams. It really is mostly just creating that. And it, it was really difficult, but looking back, like that was one of the most like, I guess like building blocks of my online career because it really showed me, I mean, it's been so long, like it's hard to remember back. And that was probably my second class that I took online, but 
um, it really required, and the, the instructions were so detailed. The professor had it set up great, and there was like, basically a TA for like every five students. And I really think, I know it's not possible in every situation, but um, it really was helpful to have somebody checking in and actually being the one to reach out to you and being like, do you understand this next step? Um, is this making sense to you? If not, let me know way before you know, it's actually due. So things like that really helped me early on. Um, so I don't know. I think that um, something that is supposed to exist um, in the ASU space is uh, the idea of success coaches and um, somebody who is familiar with uh, your situation, what your life is built like and what your course load is and the, these things. Somebody who is familiar with the complexity of a situation um, who can be a really great resource of somebody you can reach out to and say, I don't know how to, I don't know how to use Canvas. I don't know how to fill out my um, tuition reimbursement paperwork. I don't know how to access counseling services. I don't know how to access tutoring services and um, have that be a really good like touch point person um, I think could be really impactful. I don't think it's being used to its full um, capabilities. And as with anything, like some people are better at it than others. And, you know, I've, I've talked to some people and seen some people say like, like they didn't turn into assignments in their class and their success coach called them. I think that is so impactful to have somebody who is like, looking out for you in a way. Um, like if you don't show up to a class for a week, your instructor's gonna, I mean, assuming you're not in a, like a 500 person lecture, like your, your instructor's gonna notice and reach out to you. Um, and I think that's something that's really missing from the online space is that sort of personal touch of like, hey, are you okay? Yeah, that, that's a terrific point as well, because there are changes to social relationships when you go online. Uh, a lot of the cues that were acclimated to in classroom instruction and classroom learning, the contact with peers, the, the sense of normalcy that comes in when you sit down in a classroom and you recognize faces of other students that are there, there's a sense where you're seen, or at least you feel seen by the instructor and by the other students in a classroom. When you go online, it feels like you're speaking into this great void. And there are things that instructors can do. For example, Canvas and most other LMSs will give you basic stats on frequency of login and frequency of engagement. And so you'll be able to at least see who hasn't logged in in the last week. Now, if you have a course that has a few hundred students, that's difficult to email all of you know, the people that haven't logged in. Some universities use uh, analytics platforms like Civitas that give you an engagement score and that give you sort of automated email nudges that you can send out to students as well to make sure that you're at least connecting with those students who are not as consistently online as they perhaps might need to be in order to be successful. Now, ultimately, much of this, though, and I'll continue that thread, and I'll start with you, Anita, but much of this is based on the relationship. You've talked content, you've talked technology, you've talked the experience of being effective online and so on. How important are the social support activities of instructors and the connectedness to students in your own learning success online? Is that a big factor for you? Yeah, this is a great question. This was actually one of the topics that we um, kind of workshopped at our ASU, the conference we had um, just last week. Was a little bit short. But um, that was something that was a factor that we talked about. Um, it, you know, at one point, who just want to get the assignments done. They don't really need a lot of social, or at least they act like they don't need a lot of social connection. Um, sorry, I need to plug my computer in real quick. But um, I think regardless of if you want to have a social re relationship with people you go to school with, whether it's your professor or your gays or your classmates, 
it is important to know that someone is looking out for you. Like what Megan was saying with our success coaches, I have had the same experience. So yeah, it's, it's pretty much, I've been having to troubleshoot and kind of navigate it myself. And I don't think, and someone might just, it might be really helpful to either have like a, I don't know. I haven't really figured out exactly the best way to go about it. Cause I think it's different for every student in every university. Um, but there does need to be some sort of, Someone to be accountable to, I think, that you don't know personally um, is okay. Like to reach out to me. Sorry, Anita, I'm not sure if others are, but you're breaking up quite a bit. I think you may have just finished speaking, but uh, I didn't catch the, the last end of it. So I'm not sure it was just me or if others were having. Uh, the same. Oh, okay. Others were having the same audio issue. Okay. Um, well, well, thanks for the comments there, certainly on, on knowing that someone's there and someone cares. Uh, what about from you, Megan? How important was that social connection to your instructor and the interactions with fellow students? Was that a big factor for your learning success? This is a, a story that I told um, at this same conference. Um, I was in the process of applying to grad school. I'm still in the process of applying to grad school. Bless it. Um, and went to fill out my um, recommendations and, and asked for letter, letters of recommendation. And I got one from my boss, which is great, but I realized I did not have a personal experience with a single professor. Um, I didn't feel like they knew my name. I didn't feel like I had any sort of connection. Um, and I did reach out and request those and felt weird about it honestly like and there was one professor who answered me and said like if you can sub like sh prove that you did well enough in this class like sure and I'm like do you not have access to my records <laughs> um which was bananas and um I don't know a single person by name that I have probably taken multiple classes with um, and it, it, it's so isolating. It's so isolating. And I don't feel connected. And I do feel like, especially because I'm not anywhere near campus. Um, I go to Arizona State and I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Um, it's so isolating. And you, you don't make personal connections. And you do, in a lot of ways, feel like a number. Um, I am a fiercely independent person and I have community in other spaces. And so for that, I am able to say like, well, I'm here to learn, I'm here to learn, you know, I'm a returning student, I've got a lot going on. And I am able to access the education piece of it. But there's so much community that I, I don't have. Well, I'm, you know, as you were speaking, I, I will say if I had a heart rate monitor on me, you would have seen me get progressively more agitated uh, because that's absolutely not how you should experience online. I have a colleague, I'm not sure if Matt is still on the call here, but I'm going to ask him, uh, call him out just to talk a little bit about that because I know a lot of his work has been on, you know, more of the social dimensions of it. But, um, it, you know, one of the things we'll start talking about next week is we use a community of inquiry model just because it's a ground zero to get people started. And there's a lot of a social focus there. Social presence is critical. Like with the students that I've taught online in, in, in the past, I would say in many cases, I've gotten to know them better than I would students who I taught in a physical classroom because we exchange around ideas, we engage with one another, the list goes on. So, uh, and, and I've written, I mean, I, I used to teach at Athabasca University, one of the, the interviews that I did last week with Marty Cleveland Innes, she was chair uh, in that program, it's fully online master's, fully online PhD program. And, uh, you know, the, the connections I've had with students, I've written many letters of reference because I knew them, I knew their children, I knew the bark of their dogs from our live sessions that we held, you know, we had together. So I am genuinely sorry, Megan, that you've had that experience online. And to me, that's a design issue. But I'm going to just throw it over to Matt, who is not on this call, just to share some of his thoughts on this. Oh, wow. I mean, there's, there's a lot to share there. Um, I, was, I was just thinking at the time where George and I were doing a session for a, a class once and my, my son walked up to me and this is back in the Google uh, Hangout days 
where it would show your video while you were talking. And he was like, Daddy, why are you talking to yourself? And everybody in the class heard it. And we just all died laughing because he was wondering why, you know. And so I pulled him up there and had him say hi to everyone. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that I, I, we try to get the message out as much as we can to the professors and the teachers who are even doing that today. Is like, be okay with it. Be okay with uh, your learners' lives bleeding over into the class. Don't, uh, there was someone sending out uh, rules today that students had to come to the session dressed like they would to class. And uh, even though there's online, I was like, come on, <laughs> come on. Uh, we, we just got to be more flexible with this. And I realize a lot of people are just new to this and they're still trying to learn about this. But um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and people are talking, and, and I just been tweeting out, I say, I, I'm telling me professors like, and you've got to come watch this session. You've got to come watch the archive. You've got to come hear your students' voice and what they're saying about all these things about the problems with testing, the problem with proctoring, the problem with the disconnection and how we're not. Uh, you know, how we're not making our students feel connected to one another. It's, this is very important. So I, I think that your voices as students is, is some of the most important things that people can hear uh, out of this is, 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 no, it's not just someone like me who's researching it and doing all this uh, stuffy work on it. No, it's what, the, it's what the students actually say. This is the problems that they're facing. So thank you, everyone, for sharing on here. Yeah, and, and I just want to emphasize that again. Uh, you know, th th this... Uh, a great point that uh, Jana, Gianna, sorry if I'm not getting that name pronounced quite correctly, but it is about connection, not perfection that matters online. Like you don't, uh, the perfect curriculum isn't going to exist. So let's, let's get something reasonably clear. If you take a course that is, thanks, I've got the pronunciation now for next time, I hope. If you take a course online, expect less curriculum. So if in a regular course, you can cover X number of topics per week, you're not gonna cover the same thing when you're rapidly transitioning online because people are not just learning the curriculum now, they're learning the medium, they're learning the new mannerisms, they're learning the new approaches. So there's a, a, there's a level of learning that needs to happen simultaneously with the curriculum and respecting that that level of learning means unless it's a well-designed course native to the online environment, you're going to need to dial back your assumptions of how much curriculum you can cover when both you and the students are completely new to the online environment. And what matters then for students is that they know that there's someone there. Now, some systems do have a, a, almost a production line model in place where you've got success coaches and you've got people you can contact and ping this, that, and the other thing. But from my experience teaching online, there's very few things that matter more than a social connection with your instructor and activities that allow students to engage with one another. It's sloppier, it can't be measured as directly or assessed as directly, and yet it produces a sense of cohesion and a sense of identity. Katie, what about you? Um, I feel like unlike a lot of people, all of my, at least from this discussion, all of my online courses never had a face-to-face -face component. I never saw anybody ever, like if you were to ask me what the names of my instructors or my professors are, I could not tell you that to this day. I could only tell you the ones that I had the luxury to actually take their in-person in classes as well. And I liked them so much that I took their online as uh, after that. Um, and that's how I knew them, but I didn't, I could not tell you what my instructor was for half these courses. Cause I never, never met them, never saw them. If I were to have a course with them in face to face, I would, I would have no idea that they'd also taught my online class. Um, and I feel like that's the same way with, um, the students too. Um, I only met one student in my one online course one time because we had to do a group project together for a psychological measurements course that needed us to use some software that we can only get at the university. So I only met him at the university one time and I still to this day cannot tell you his name. So it's like we have all these discussion boards to facilitate interactions between students, but they're not used to necessarily facilitate interactions or keep these connections between students. It's almost like a requirement versus an actual social interaction. Um, I felt the, the most I ever felt like I connected with the other students in an online class was one time our professor made us take a five minute video of us in our daily activities 
to give everybody a reference of what we were doing when we were in this online class. Um, it was five minutes, basically an introduction. What do you do for work? Where are you like taking this course? When are the hours you're online? And kind of, it was put up on a discussion board so you could always go back and see who this person was before talking to them. Um, but the fact was no face-to-face, -face. like I said, I could not tell you half the professors I had. Well, uh, you know, that's, that's some, uh, thank you all for being so uh, honest about your experiences. And I, I hope for the teachers that, and the faculty and the, the support staff that are going to be moving online, uh, if, if there's anything you take away, take away that, be human. I mean, it's, it's fine to ask people to share stories, you know, about their pets. And it's, you know, there should be a space for lack of a better word, just the stuff that happens in person. Uh, by the way, Tanya, I'm going to turn to you in a bit to take this home and wrap up the call today. Uh, just share some of your, your insights from a research lens. So over the last three or four minutes. But I just want to emphasize again that the social habits that create a cohesive community-based environment in person can be duplicated online. It's different, but it really starts with a mindset of wanting to know about your students, hear about your students, designing some activities that aren't learning based that allow you to share a meme, share a silly story, uh, that allow you to comment on one another's posts in a way that, that uh, has an impact, that gives you face-to-face -face time like this. Like if we were to meet, and some of you that are gonna be in this course for the duration of this, uh, this edX uh, course that runs you know, five weeks starting on Monday, you'll, you'll get to know one another, the frequent people, you'll get to know them and you will get to hear your stories about them and you will get to hear their, their pets and their kids and their everything else. And I think that's so critical. So if I can encourage anything, it's foster the sloppy social dynamics that make for in-person cohesion. You can do it online with the right mindset and the willingness to just be connected to others. Tanya, do you mind sort of wrapping up with some concluding thoughts based on your research and your experience? Sure. I think what is interesting here today is that, you know, when we talked about Monday, things that we should be thinking about, I know a lot of face-to-face, -face, traditionally face-to-face -face faculty or on-campus faculty are thinking about content, like, how do I get my lectures online? Should I be just live lecturing and Zoom to everyone? And the number one point that drive home, drives home to me is listening to all of the students. None of them gave advice or had concerns about how the lecture came. I mean, it was very much in how they're supported, how they're supported with the technology and the course design, how there's connections built, how there's opportunities for authentic assessment and more high order forms of assessment beyond just proctored exams. And so I'm really excited as we move forward in the coming weeks to talk about each of these areas in more depth. And I think for those of us joining us who are the traditional faculty member who has a more lectured or teacher centered model to just hear firsthand that there's probably other things that you should be thinking about than um, you know how to use Zoom and how to do live lectures. So, and I really look forward. You know, I'm on the same page with George coming from the field of communication. I think the interaction that we have to create and online that we structure to have connections with our students uh, is and to create actually for our students to have connections amongst themselves is is really important and is a key part of learning that we've actually known for about 100 years, but we seem to have forgotten about. So I'll look forward to, um, you know, working on this in more detail and more depth as we move forward. Thanks, George. Great, thanks, uh, Tanya, for those excellent reflections. I just want to uh, reflect the S-R-I-F-O-R-G-I post in the chat area, which is, uh, yeah, thank you so much to, to uh, you know, Anita, Megan, and Katie. I think you've provided a, just a really solid assessment of your experience as students, and hopefully for everyone on, on the session today, invoked a desire to address, the be human first, be connected with your students first. It's not, a, like Tanya noted, it's not a curriculum focus. Yes, the curriculum is the intent, but the bigger intent is the learning, and you can you can foster that learning through social interactions, through people sharing their resources, and the list goes on. So I just want to say a terrific thank you, uh, Katie, uh, Megan, and Anita for sharing your insights with us.
For the rest of you, we are going to be back here again tomorrow, same time, and we're going to be focusing a little bit more on some of the active learning and the related dynamics. What you're going to find in the next several areas uh, is that we are slowly going to transition to uh, a deeper dive into the research. We're going to start moving more to uh, sort of the you know, sharing bibliographies of what you may want to do and use, even though our interest is to focus on you doing what's minimally acceptable to succeed in the online environment. But if, if anything else, it's the humanist end that's so critical here that's come across strongly. Thanks everyone, Tanya, Matt, Justin, if you guys have a second, it'd be good to sort of debrief after we're finished here. I'm gonna stop the recording.